Hello and welcome. As the second wave of COVID-19 recedes, we are slowly restoring a semblance of normality to our lives. Except for one glaring fact, India's children, its future, are not going to schools. With some experts insisting that the third wave can be brutal for children, the largest unvaccinated population, the opening of schools has become a contentious issue. With a recurring dip in the number of COVID cases, some states have allowed physical school in some sort of hybrid form to restart. Haryana, Telangana, Gujarat, Punjab, Odisha. This week, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences director, Dr. Randeep Guleria, said that schools could be opened in areas where the positivity rate is low and where staff are vaccinated. Still, this is a complicated and a high-risk, high-gain issue. But tonight, we're not asking, should schools reopen? Are schools safe for children? The question needs to be, when are schools opening and how can we make our schools safe for our children? With 15 months lost, how do we get India's children safely back in schools and learning again? I want to start with the people tonight with Dr. Chandrakant Laheria. He's an epidemiologist and a health system specialist. Dr. Laheria, the UNICEF has said that in their efforts to limit transmission, governments have too often kept schools closed for prolonged periods, even though the epidemiological situation doesn't warranty it. UNICEF also says we cannot wait for cases to go to zero. There is clear evidence that primary and secondary schools are not among the main drivers of transmission. Dr. Laheria, is this true? And does the epidemiological situation in India, of course, varying from state to state, warranty keeping our schools closed still? So when we are talking today, around the world, around 170 countries have their schools open, either partially or fully, or they are closed only for summer vacations. So schools are, schools are open across the world. That's one. Second, even at the peak of the pandemic in many countries, Finland, Sweden, Florida states of the United States, the schools were open and they were only temporarily closed. And with all of this happening, we have more than 15 months of evidence that schools do not contribute to the transmission of the virus more than what children are exposed at the home. Because we know when intermittent between the lockdowns, the parents, uh, mother, father, other members go and they come back and then they expose children. And that's how we know through various zero surveys, the proportion of children who are zero positive, who have antibodies, are, is very similar to what is the zero prevalence in adults. And that's, that has happened when schools were closed and there is no additional risk. And that's what global evidence says. Rather, there are two more things which I would like to highlight. One that global experts are saying that uh, especially the children between the age of 2 to 11 years would not need or uh, vaccination is not a prerequisite to open the schools mm. because children yes. are already exposed we do not know whether they would need vaccine for uh, uh, for uh, opening the schools and not, or not so all of those things are supporting that schools should be open and final point two points in many of the settings, so especially in rural areas, children are already intermingling with each other, but they are not coming to school, and that's really unfortunate part. Even in urban settings, children are in, uh, intermingling and mixing with each other, but they are not coming to the schools. We're also, they're so all also of going those to challenges malls. Are there. The final point is that pa parents should not be worried. What they need to remember that even when schools will be open, there would be choice with them that whether they want to uh, go for online learning for their kids or whether they want to send their children to the in-person physical schooling. Sure. Well, so, you know, I was smiling in the beginning because uh, I know the reality is we cannot compare our schools with schools in Finland and Sweden. Uh, but that said, the points uh, you're making uh, are basically that uh, there is no epidemiological reason that warrants schools continuing to stay closed. Well, Rajasthan was one of the states where schools were to reopen on the 2nd of August. Now they've uh, recently gone back on that decision. And we have the Education Minister of Rajasthan, Govind Singh uh, Dottasra, joining us. Uh, uh, Dottasra ji, thank you for your time. Rajasthan first announced the school will be reopened. There was a lot of celebration. There was a lot of criticism also. Now you are reconsidering this decision. Why, sir? Kya hua hai? Kya problem hai? ऐसा है बच्चों को सुरक्षित रखना हमारी प्रथम प्रायोरिटी है और हमने मंत्रिमंडल के समूह में भी चर्चा की थी 
जो फीडबैक हमारे पास में आ रहा था वो ये आ रहा था कि भाई बच्चों को काफी दिन से घर हो गए हैं और स्वीप के पास में गांव ढाणी में बैठे बच्चे के पास में ऑनलाइन सुविधा नहीं है तो उसको स्कूल में आना चाहिए और हमने प्रपोज किया था दो अगस्त से हमारी स्कूलें नौ से बारह की खोलने का लेकिन जब चर्चा में यह निकल कर के आया कि आई जो ये कह रहा है कि छोटो बच्चों पर कोई दिक्कत नहीं है बड़ों पर दिक्कत है तो फिर ये तय रहा कि हम लोग सैद्धांतिक रूप से सहमत हैं कि हमें विद्यालय खोलना है लेकिन इसकी एसओपी क्या होगी इसकी डेट क्या होगी तो इसको लेकर के रोका गया था लेकिन चूंकि हमारा विभाग का प्रस्ताव था कि 2 अगस्त को तो हमने एक दिमाग ये बनाया कि हमें तैयारी रखनी चाहिए 2 अगस्त से लेकिन जब दूसरे दिन मीडिया के माध्यम से सब जगह से एक चर्चा आई और अभिभावकों की तरफ से भी काफी सोशल मीडिया में और दूसरी जगह से भी आई कि साहब अभी हम बच्चों को नहीं भेजना चाहते हैं अभी बच्चों के ऊपर थर्ड वेव जो आएगी वो बच्चों पे खतरनाक रहेगी काफी दूसरे स्टेट से भी हमने बात की तो उन्होंने कहा हमने छोटे बच्चों की भी खोली बड़े बच्चों की खोली है जबकि आई कहता है कि छोटे बच्चों की खोल दीजिए बड़े बच्चों की जरूरत नहीं है अभी रोकना चाहिए तो ऐसे में एक पांच मंत्रिमंडलीय समूह की एक बनाई गई समिति और ये तय किया गया कि अन्य स्टेट से भी हम बात करें भारत सरकार से भी बात करें और सीबीएसई बोर्ड से भी हम लोग बात करें और सब जगह से कर करके एक तरीके से हम कंफर्म हो लें कि हमारे बच्चों के भविष्य में कोई दिक्कत नहीं है तब जा करके हम विद्यालयों को खोलें मिस्टर दोतासरा आई आस्क यू दिस नॉट जस्ट एज एन एजुकेशन मिनिस्टर ऑफ योर स्टेट बट एज ए रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ ऑफ गवर्नमेंट्स यूनिसेफ ने कहा है कि स्कूल शुड बी द लास्ट टू क्लोज एंड द फर्स्ट टू रीओपन इंटरनेशनली गवर्नमेंट्स आर फॉलोइंग दिस इफ केसेस आर राइजिंग देन क्लोज रेस्टोरेंट्स फर्स्ट पहले रेस्टोरेंट्स को बंद करो स्पाज बार्स इफ यू वॉन्ट टू की पीपल टू पीपल कॉन्टैक्ट लो बट हमारे देश में सब कुछ खुला है एक्सेप्ट फॉर स्कूल नहीं 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 ऐसा नहीं है हम हम खुद ही तो कह रहे हैं ना कि जब अभी कोरोना का जो कम हुआ संक्रमण तो हमने स्कूल खोलने का प्रस्ताव भेज दिया है ऐसा नहीं चाहती राजस्थान गवर्नमेंट लेकिन राजस्थान गवर्नमेंट ये चाहती है सरकार ये चाहती है कि हमारे बच्चे के कहीं कोई दिक्कत नहीं आए तो सब जगह से हम शोर होने आप बताइए भारत सरकार भी नहीं खोल रहा है भारत सरकार कुछ नहीं कह रहा है दस ग्यारह स्टेट में स्कूल खुली है वो भी नौ से बारह ही खुली है तो फिर पूरे स्टेटों में ने भी अभी नहीं खोली और जो मेडिकल साइड के जो लोग हैं डॉक्टर हैं जो विशेषज्ञ हैं वो बार बार एक ही बात कह रहे हैं कि साहब छोटे बच्चों के दिक्कत हो सकती है छोटे बच्चों की दिक्कत हो सकती है तो निश्चित रूप से थोड़ा सा कंफ्यूजन करने वाली स्थिति है लेकिन मैं आपको कह सकता हूं एज ए शिक्षा मंत्री कि हमारे मुख्यमंत्री जी हमारी सरकार हमारे मंत्री सारे के सारे ये चाहते हैं कि हमारे बच्चों की पढ़ाई बाधित नहीं होनी चाहिए इसलिए हम पूरी तरीके से इस बात के लिए तैयार हैं कि हम स्कूल खोलें लेकिन इसकी एसओपी क्या होनी चाहिए इसकी डेट क्या होनी चाहिए वो हम इंश्योर करना चाहते हैं सबसे बात करके भारत सरकार से और विशेषज्ञों से और उसके बाद में जल्दी इस विषय के ऊपर हमारे माननीय मुख्यमंत्री अशोक गहलोत जी इसको अंतिम निर्णय लें थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर योर टाइम एंड इम्पॉर्टेंट पॉइंट यू रेज दट देर इज नो लाइक क्लियर मैसेजिंग कमिंग आउट ऑफ द सेंटर व्हिच लीव्स पेरेंट्स इन अ सिचुएशन वेयर यू हैव अ स्कूल व्हिच इज मे बी इन हरियाणा लाइक इन इन डेली फॉर एग्जांपल यू हैव द सेम स्कूल व्हिच हैज अ ब्रांच इन हरियाणा एंड अ डिफरेंट ब्रांच इन यूपी पेरेंट्स इन इन हरियाणा आर सेंडिंग द चिल्ड्रन टू स्कूल बट पेरेंट्स इन यूपी कांट इट्स रियली आइरोनिकल इन द पेरेंट्स आर स्टक इन द मिडल तानिया अगरवाल जॉइन्स अस नाउ शी इज द पेरेंट ऑफ अ चाइल्ड इन अ क्लास वन इन ए डेली स्कूल तानिया द कनाड्रम हियर यू हैव राजस्थान वेर द गवर्नमेंट सेज दैट दे आर विलिंग टू ओपन स्कूल्स दे हेट प्लान टू ओपन स्कूल्स बट देन दे वर हिट बाई क्रिटिसिजम एंड ए प्रोटेस्ट दैट वॉज टेकन आउट बाई पेरेंट्स who then who 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 i think feared that they'd have to pay fees again and then the third wave will hit and school will close anyway uh where do you stand how do you see this there are fears out there but the science uh is saying that it is safe for children to go to school but it's the parents who now need to be won over first so there is a fear certainly um but i think we do need to listen to the science to address that fear uh nothing is risk free there is a risk yes but the question is how can we mitigate it we can't wait for a zero case scenario that's never going to happen covid is here to stay we can't wait for 100% vaccination because again we don't know when it's going to happen 
uh, vaccines for children. Um, they're still in development. Some countries like the UK have, in fact, said that they will not vaccinate kids, young kids, unless they are very vulnerable. Uh, so I don't think it's practical, you know, to wait um, for kids to be vaccinated. We we have to assess how we can get comfortable with uh, staggered school opening, for example. Um, so what we can do is start in smaller groups, maybe once a week. Uh, we can do alternate days, alternate weeks. But the first step in all of that is to get school staff vaccinated. Obviously, I think they have the maximum exposure. And similar to our healthcare workers, similar to students who are going abroad to study, we should check whether the gap between doses can be reduced for school staff. Let's draw up lists of school staff. Let's vaccinate them on priority. In India, we have multi-generational households. You know, we're not entirely nuclear. You, you mentioned Finland, right? So we can't export Finland here. Um, but then it's up to us to make sure that we as adults are vaccinated, all the elders in our house are vaccinated. So the more we step up adult vaccination, I feel we can protect unvaccinated children. And, and obviously the statements from Dr. Guleria and from the ICMR are all now encouraging because yeah. the science is increasingly supporting a staggered opening with risk mitigation. So Tanya, your child is in class one, which means he, That's he right. must be five or six. Um, would you send your child to school if your school opened up physically? Because, you know, younger kids may not keep their masks on. Maybe your child will keep his mask on, his or her mask on, but other students in class won't. So um, personally, I think at a young age, it's actually easier to train kids to follow routines. They they love routines. So you tell them that, you know, these are the five steps you need to do to get ready for school. They'll do it. They'll absorb it. And if you miss a step, they'll be the first ones to catch you. So I think it is possible to train them to ingrain that. Routine. But you would send, and my question is, you would send your child to school? Yes. Okay. Uh, Chandrika Bahadur joins us. She is the Vice President of Education at uh, SDSN, the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network. She's the Director of the SDG Academy, a flagship education platform um, and of the Global Initiative for the United Nations. Uh, Chandrika, the UNICEF also says that reopening schools cannot wait for teachers and students to be vaccinated because the Delhi government has said schools won't reopen until everybody is vaccinated. Now, that doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime because the reality is we're in a huge shortage of vaccines. So 15 months lost, a vaccine shortage. Do we need to work around this? Chandrika, do we not know enough about COVID-19 to be able to open schools safely? I don't think that's true, Sarah. Uh, I think uh, uh, there is uh, obviously a risk attached to any opening up of any part of the sector. But there are a few points I want to make. You know, I'm, um, I, I also uh, represent the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, where we brought out a report in March, hmm. uh, essentially making the point that if we want to open, first making the point that we do need to think about opening schools, hmm. but making the point that we, if we are to open schools in July, August, which is what our uh, recommendation was, that there are a lot of steps that need to be taken before one can open schools. It's not a decision that can be a purely administrative one that is taken um, overnight. It has to be a consultative decision, uh, talking to teachers, talking to um, parent-teacher associations, talking to school staff, but also understanding where society stands in, co in the context of uh, risk exposure to COVID. Uh, so it has to be part of an overall assessment strategy. That's the first point. The second point is when we talk about risk strategies and as an assessment of benefits and costs, I think one thing that didn't get discussed um, for a long time in India, and I'm very happy to see that it's beginning to be discussed, uh, are the costs of keeping schools closed versus the benefits of keeping schools closed. So in terms of costs, I don't want to belabor the point because I think it's been made over and over again, but we do know that uh, there are learning losses that are significant, particularly in the early years. Yes. And those are very difficult to catch up uh, to later on. And, you know, we've seen studies, some of our task force members have done studies of other natural disasters where schools were closed for a couple of years. And they've actually tracked a 15% lifetime income loss for children who missed out on a couple of years of schooling. Wow. Now, that is not an economic cost that is uh, talked about in the way that the economic cost of keeping malls shut or restaurants shut is, is talked about because those are immediate livelihood losses. But we're talking about a vast majority of this country that in 20, 25 years' time, 
will actually not be able to earn up to 15% of what they otherwise would. So that's just a pure instrumental argument. But there are nutritional arguments. There are arguments on um, mental and social well-being, socialization of children. And one of the uh, points that was made earlier was that uh, this is actually uh, you know, unsafe for children because you know, children will get exposed. But the fact is that the pediatricians that have worked with us, and we brought yeah. out a paper that they wrote, where they basically highlighted the incredible costs of children staying at home yeah. um, from health, physical well-being, but also emotional well-being. So that's the second point. The third point is that on preparation. You've asked the question of vaccinations. Frankly, at this point, uh, post second wave, I do not see the value of uh, having this conversation without talking about vaccinating not just teachers, but all school staff on a priority basis. And we can do it. And I don't think that the supply issue is a constraint if we are to prioritize uh, the school staff as frontline workers. Now, obviously, if you're vaccinating everybody else and not prioritizing them, you're right. We'll never get through this. But if this really is a, an objective, then it's the bus drivers, it's the cleaners. All of them I need think, to be vaccinated. I think first. you've hit the nail on the head. I, in the end, this is an issue of priorities, right? Because I say this because we've opened malls. Malls are bigger than most school buildings that I've seen. They see more footfall in a day. So if we can make malls safe, if we can enforce social distancing, crack down on numbers, make sure the security guards, etc., persons working in those stores are vaccinated, why can't we do that in our schools? It is a question of priority, but there's also a reality on the ground. Praneet uh, Mungali, the trustee of the Sanskriti group of schools. Uh, Praneet, you know, the reality is that, um, uh, as we talked about school buses, kids have to come to school in school buses, the classroom size, washrooms, buses. We could see uh, potentials of uh, super spreaders here. Is it possible uh, for us to have more physical classes? Our infrastructure has been terrible till now. How can we reduce the number of children in classes? How can we increase the number of classes? How can we increase the number of teachers? Is it realistic? Well, Sarah, I think it's incumbent upon all the stakeholders who are a part of the system to come up with new paradigms and new solutions to confront the reality right now. And uh, some of these solutions are already in play in terms of hybrid classes where a percentage of the students will be attending campus physically and a percentage of the students will be attending campus home digitally like they're doing right now. In addition to that, obviously new SOPs will have to be conducted, but I think the crux of all of these measures is communication and consensus building because any SOPs or any methods, etc., which are only on paper are of no use. So a lot of effort needs to go in communicating with all the stakeholders about how these new norms have to be implemented. And I think the answer is yes. There are obviously going to be some challenges and there are going to be some um, process innovations which will have to be done, but it is possible to come up with this and forge it ahead. Um, thank you. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time on this. This is a discussion we want to raise. Yes, it's a gamble. It's a risk. Yet in the greatest, uh, the long term cost of this pandemic may be borne by our children. As our panelists have said, countries around the world have opened schools. Large number of Indian children, though, have dropped out of schools. Many will have learning gaps, which will make it harder for them to keep pace whenever they return to schools and that's something we're all going to have to live with. Thank you all uh, for joining us on We The People tonight. We appreciate your time and we will keep this conversation going. Well, welcome back. Time now for our special campaign, Vaccinate India, in partnership with Google. This is where we discuss questions that you may have about uh, vaccines, getting vaccinated. We have Dr. Jaisal Sheth. He's a senior consultant, a pediatrician at Fortis Hospital, Mumbai, joining us today on the show. Dr. Seth, thank you. Uh, you know, um, we are now, in the next week, the, 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 those people who were under 45, uh, who were allowed to take their vaccines on the 1st of May will now be starting to be due for their second dose after three months. So let me ask you first uh, the question, how long does it take to develop immunity after a COVID vaccine? Or so, both doses? Uh, I mean, 
yeah approximately two weeks so when we uh, we look at the testing guidelines uh, we tr uh, we try to i mean optimal antibody levels we try to test around after one month of the dose but one can test it as early as after two weeks and uh, doctor you know we were just talking about uh, when we can open schools and how we can open schools and everybody was of course talking about the fact that our teachers and all our school staff need to be vaccinated on a priority can a vaccinated person give covid to an unvaccinated person in this context of course we're talking about the children or the students who are not uh, due or available allowed to take vaccines right now uh, I, 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 I didn't get the question clear. Are you trying to tell that a vaccine, a vaccinated person can be the carrier and spreader to the non-vaccinated children? If an un, if a, if a vaccinated person can give COVID to an unvaccinated person. So see, vaccinated person will not get the disease, but still his body, his nose, his you know mouth can be colonized with the virus and can infect other people. So basically, as of now, we all across the globe, we, we don't, we have not decided to put our guards down except few countries. So even if the person is vaccinated with the two doses, which is we call so far in you know, optimal vaccination schedule available in the country still he or she is supposed to put the guards on so that you know they don't uh, carry or cross infect the other people uh, this is the right now our current uh, guideline in the country and uh, ma'am you know we were just talking about the irony of how so much has opened up in india uh, you can go to malls you can go to spas in delhi starting monday the metro is running at full capacity yet our schools are closed and our children are not getting uh, to go to school like they did um, normally in a normal world um, when you hear about, you know, bars, restaurants, etc. open and everyone's going in now for their second doses, is it okay, allowed, uh, is one supposed to have alcohol? Would you advise that one can have a, a glass, if so, or how much, if you're getting vaccinated? Uh, in terms of uh, the glass of the alcohol is okay, but in general, you know, uh, uh, basically, as doctors, we don't encourage the people to consume the alcohol after the vaccination for various, you know, other reasons. So, uh, it, not that that you know, glass of the alcohol is going to not give you a good antibody titers, but in general, you know, people can have so many other comorbidities and other things. So, uh, alcohol is not strongly encouraged by any clinician in the country, you know, after taking the, the vaccines. And are there more side effects when you take your second dose? Uh, no, I'm not sure. I, these are the Google questions, right? I, okay, so I mean, no, 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 not at all. I mean, there is no correlation between the first and the second dose. Again, it depends on the person's immune status, person's coping capacity, the, you know, uh, the body's response, as well as uh, the type of the vaccine person is taking. But there is no direct correlation between, you know, first dose and second dose. In fact, I would say second time person is probably very much uh, ready to anticipate the, you know the side effects of the vaccine so probably is expected to cope up better no. but in terms of the you know from the medical standpoint of you know no vaccine says that the second dose gives you the more side effects compared to the first dose that is not true okay and ma'am you're a pediatrician so i want to ask you i'm sure yeah. you're you're meeting parents who are fearful and wondering whether they should send their children back to school at the same time knowing how the children are getting affected by not going to school. What do you say? You have those uh, uh, Lancet COVID-19 India Commission Task Force says there's a less impact on schools opening on transmission rates. This is because uh, more experts and doctors are now saying that uh, children um, uh, are less likely to be impacted or, or deal with viruses better than adults do. See, uh, you know, children deal better with the viruses compared to adult. This is this is a this is a certainly this is a you know this is how we say socially, but medically, you know, how do we come to this conclusion? That is based on all the available you know publications from across the different countries, where we have clearly seen that the number of the children getting infected and number of the children requiring hospitalization or ICU care are far lesser compared to the adults. So that is, you know, based, not that children will not get infected, but we are not expecting them to have too much of the severity of the disease, mm. which mm. we could see, you know, in the second wave. And of course, you know, seeing an unwell child is far more stressful 
blissful than seeing an adult, uh, uh, you know, unwell because of the COVID-19 infection in the same family. So th this is this is very much true. But at the same time, you know, we are we are discussing various aspects. So you know, if we try to break down these questions, number one, do we want to uh, send the children to the school? If you ask me as a mother, I, my answer is yes. If you ask me as a pediatrician, yes, of course, because children are socially isolated. So when we talk about you know the emotional quotient, I think they need to go to school. Right. They need physical interaction. They need to go and you know meet the teacher. At the same time, there are a lot of logistics issues in terms of to we want safety of our children who are going to the school yes. so in that case we need that you know assurance by the schools that you know proper covid measures will be uh, taken care of and children and are enforced. expected well, to dr shet that was the question yeah. i was wanting to ask you whether you would as a mother uh, uh, send your child to school you've answered that question both as a mother and especially as a doctor as a pediatrician you would say children need to and it's time they can go back to school right now thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight on our discussion. That's it. Bye-bye.